those of you who read the papers and like to read the columnists will know that Ms. K is uh, a, a dynamite writer of essays, has a Catholic range of uh, subject matters, and because she wasn't able to attend last year, I never got around to figuring out where I would actually slot her. Was it in the section about politics? Um, might it be in the section about social mores or, uh, or what, <laughs> whatever? Um, as I say, so broad is her range. So um, in this pod called Unfinished Business, I thought I would invite her one year later to come out on stage and give us a sense of what she might have said <laughs> one year ago. This is Barbara Kay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've often read that public speaking is people's number one fear. And always following that, I see that the number two fear is death. I used to think that was absurd. But then I saw that I was following Conrad Black, <laughs> and uh, that fact achieved a new depth of meaning for me. Um, Thank you, Moses, for that nice introduction. Uh, I, too, would have hated to... I, I didn't even realize when you invited me last year that it was going to be an all-women's program, and I, too, would have hated it because uh, <laughs> not only do I not like to, to sort of fall into that, you know, gender thing, I, 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 uh, I, I had my education pre-feminism, uh, but also I, I think that most of the other women there would have hated what I had to say, and I would have had a very frosty reception. Um, I, I am known uh, at the Post for standing up for men's rights, and uh, my column today is about uh, why haven't we got equal parenting for as a uh, presumption, a default in our legal system. Uh, I do feel that women get tremendous exposure. I don't think they're lacking exposure in our press, in the media altogether, uh, in every institutional policy book, there's always, what are we doing for women? Uh, so I think women are very well served in our society, uh, and it's time that women were thinking about societies in which women are not well served at all, and I would love to see uh, our leading feminists start looking at uh, societies in which that is the case. Today is June 15th. It is a kind of special anniversary for me. It is the day uh, that uh, the father and brother of Axa Parvez were sentenced uh, for her murder in 2007. The name Axa Parvez, I'm sure, must resonate with many of you. She was a 16-year-old girl, a South Asian girl, uh, whose crime, according to her family, was that she was too westernized. Uh, she wanted to integrate into Canadian life. She had regular Canadian friends of different heritages, Canadian heritage, um, and uh, she wanted to not wear a hijab, she wanted to wear lipstick, she wanted to do what ordinary 16-year-old Canadian girls do. Uh, according to her family, uh, that uh, meant she was shaming them, and uh, something had to be done about it. Uh, it was a very calculated, long-planned punishment, and there were two things about that murder. Uh, by the way, Axa Parvez, although she was not the first honor killing in Canada, uh, her, her murder did start, it, it got the ball rolling on the discussion of honor killings as what they were, uh, honor killings. We've now had 12 honor killings in Canada in which honor was reportedly the motive and was admitted to by the murderers always the father involvement, sometimes brothers or other kinsmen. Um, that is not, does not reflect the reality. There have been more than 12, but they have not been admitted to. Uh, there are 12 honor killings a year in Great Britain, and they now have a special unit, a special police unit to uh, deal with those, those crimes. Two things struck me about the Axa Parvez case. The first was uh, that uh, Anybody that suggested that it was an honor killing was immediately leaped on by uh, the press uh, to say that was an extremely racist thing to say, uh, that it indicted an entire community, and that no, it was a domestic violence, could have happened to anybody. 
the second thing uh, that bothered me about that was that uh, people who did say that it was an honor killing were called racist. So, it, the phenomenon, the, the, and, and I, oh, sorry, the second thing that bothered me about it was, I'm sorry, the first thing was that it was racist and uh, domestic violence, and the second thing that bothered me was uh, that the system had not failed her. Very often we see tragedies and people say, oh, the system failed her if only she'd gotten help. AXA did try to get help. She told her teachers about the abuse that was going on at home. She told social workers, she told the police. Everybody knew about it. Everybody tried to help her. Her parents were called in and spoken to by the police. They pretended to say, oh yes, we understand now. Thank you very much. Her mother lured her home uh, on a pretext and that's when she was killed. At the time, her mother said to the press, geez, I, I, I didn't know my husband was going to kill her. I thought he was only going to break her arms and legs. Um, so to call this, uh, to call this domestic violence uh, is extremely insulting and disingenuous uh, to, to the memory of AXA and all the other uh, young girls, mostly from South Asia, that have been um, killed in these honor killings. What, what does this mean, an honor killing? Why, why do we call it? People say you shouldn't call it honor killings because it's extremely dishonorable, it's immoral. Of course it's immoral, it's barbaric. But honor does not have much to do with morality or rights. Honor has to do with feeling that you have the good opinion of those who matter to you. And if you come from a culture in which the barometer of a family's honor uh, rests on the chastity, the purity, the modesty of the girls in the family and totally rests on that, then you've got a situation uh, in which the slightest deviation from the role that these girls and women play in the family, uh, any deviation can bring shame to the family and they must suffer, even if it's not their fault. And we've all heard about girls that have been raped and they're the ones that get killed, not the... Um, domestic violence is something quite different from uh, honor motivated abuse. Uh, domestic violence always takes place between two individuals. It's, 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 a, it's about intimate sexual dysfunction. Uh, uh, so it's about inter intimate partner violence, and that's what it's called now, IPV, intimate partner violence. Honor killing uh, is, is uh, a family, a kinsman, a collective kind of thing. It's not about individuals. It's about endorsed violence. Uh, it is social terrorism. And I call it terrorism because the punishments meted out to these girls are meant to terrorize other girls uh, in the community to say, this can happen to you, watch it. You have to be submissive, you have to do what your family wants you to do. Uh, so I got quite involved in this, in this subject and I, I did write a column about it and I got an email two years ago from a woman called Aruna Pap. And uh, she is a South Asian woman from India, from the Punjab. And she said, you get it. She says, this is what I've been trying to tell people for, for 25, 27 years now. Uh, nobody wants to hear this. My own community doesn't want to hear it because it's airing dirty laundry in public. Feminists don't want to hear it because uh, it spoils their theory that the patriarchy is all about the inherent essential badness of men. Uh, when I say that it's a cultural thing, uh, they don't want to know about that because that would seem to mean that if men are cult culturally conditioned, to be bad, they can be culturally conditioned to be good. And it must mean that the guys in our society are pretty good, and they are. You have to understand, domestic violence in our country is not a problem in the statistical sense. 40 women a year are killed in a population of 35 million. That is statistically nothing. By the way, 20 men are killed by their intimate partners also. So, you know, it's not what you would call a statistical problem. In Pakistan alone, Insiders say that there are up to 10,000 honor killings a year, and Pakistan has about 65 million people. So we're talking about a phenomenon that is huge in South Asia, the Middle East. This is not a religious, a specific religious problem, by the way. It's true that most honor killings are by Muslims, but they are also by Hindus, Sikhs, and even Christians. Uh, Aruna is a third generation Christian. She is ethnically Indian. But she grew up in an honor society and she uh, wanted to tell her story and uh, needed a professional writer to do it with and that's what we've been doing for the last year. Uh, certainly one of the most gratifying experiences I've ever had. The book is coming out next February. There are little flyers upstairs in the bookstore uh, and it's called um, Unworthy Creature, uh, a Punjabi daughter's memoir of honor, shame and love. Aruna grew up 
first 21 years of her life uh, in a society in which uh, every day of her life she heard that she was an unworthy creature. Uh, and her grandmother used to joke about throwing her down the well because there were too many girls in the family. Uh, her mother had abortion after abortion until she finally produced a boy, uh, you know, who, who was like the savior of the family. Uh, she came to Canada as, as, a, as a young mother with practically illiterate, with uh, two children, three, two children, she had a third one here. Um, and uh, her story of, of uh, not only survival of an abusive marriage, but her determination to get an education and her willingness to, she's got two AMAs from York University, and, and her willingness to speak out against all the women that she researched. She was the first person uh, in Canada to research uh, a, a violence in uh, the South Asian community. Uh, she was vilified by her community. She was threatened. Uh, one guy threatened her with a gun. Uh, nobody wanted to hear it. Racism, they called it. You can't do this. And the feminists didn't want to hear about it. Nobody wanted to hear about it. Uh, today, that situation, thankfully, has changed somewhat. Uh, Aruna, uh, you know, she says people don't get it because they don't understand that, that, that people, these families, they, they don't deal with individuals per se, they deal in roles. She says, you're indoctrinated from the day you're born. She says, I was told my whole life uh, that I was unworthy because I was a girl and it didn't matter. I couldn't have my father's love. Uh, I loved him so much and she never stopped loving her father and always wanted his love and approval. Uh, she was the oldest of seven children, only one a boy. And um, her adventures, I, I call them adventures, but some of them are, are pretty horrific. Uh, just, but just to show you, how people do not get it uh, about honor-motivated violence. Um, she was, she, when she was 11, she was raped by a kinsman. He raped her anally because he wanted to preserve her virginity. This is a common story, apparently. Um, she knew better than to tell anybody because she knew she'd be the one punished for it, and she knew she was damaged goods. So when she had her arranged marriage, it was really a forced marriage with an older man, she was uh, terrified that her secret would come out uh, at her wedding night. She didn't even know what was going to happen on her wedding night, but she was very, very frightened about it. Uh, thankfully, nothing did, although she did say to an aunt later, she says, what would have happened if I had, uh, if I had told, uh, or if he had known, or it had been discovered, uh, and her aunt said, who loved her, she says, I would have given you the poison myself. Uh, she said, what could we have done? Our family's honor would have been at stake. But here's the interesting thing. When she spoke to feminists here, and she, she, she listened to them at York University, and they were telling her about uh, how, how she had to be strong and all this, but then when she would talk about her family, they'd say, well, you know, in the context, you know, cultures, everybody, no culture's better than another, and you have to, uh, uh, you can't really blame your father or your husband. Or your, you know, she was getting this mixed message, uh, and she didn't like it. When she was 14, she saw uh, a young woman from her rooftop uh, in Delhi uh, set on fire, and she watched her burn to death. And she said everybody stood around her in a circle. It had been rumored that this young woman had fallen in love with someone, uh, and her brother had promised her to another, and the brother had set her on fire. Everybody stood in a circle and watched. She says, nobody screamed, nobody fainted, nobody... She says, so I was contextualized. She says, so I, I didn't know that I should be horrified. Uh, she says, I was fascinated and scared, but I, I wasn't horrified. Why wasn't I horrified? Uh, a week later, the brother who set her on fire uh, at the same place, they had his wedding, and the same women were standing around and beseeching the heavens to rain down gifts on the happy couple. When she finally went to a therapist in Canada, she went to a, a woman therapist and told, for the first time, she told somebody, this woman uh, that she had been raped for, over the course of many years, this, the same guy had raped her, and the woman said, you have to confront your family, you have to tell them about it, because they have to acknowledge your suffering. And she says, geez, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, and the therapist says, no, the only way a woman can get closure in these instances is to have her suffering acknowledged. So you have to speak to your family, you have to tell them. So she did. Predictably, they all turned against her. How dare you? How, you, how dare you bring this up? And, and of course, the guy that she had, uh, that she had blamed, uh, he was brought ever closer into the bosom of the family and made much of, and she was the one, she was basically excommunicated from her family. No one was allowed to talk to her. She was like a leper. Interestingly, the women in her family came over to her and said, Aruna, why did you do that? Why did you tell? Now, look, look, look at our lives now. I have to have him in our house socially. I have to, you know, there's all these special occasions and weddings. He's going to be there. You've ruined it for all of us. Do you think you're the only one? 
This is going on in our communities, and nobody wants to talk about it, or very few people want to talk about it, but they don't want to identify it as a culturally motivated phenomenon. This is what I hope our book, uh, Aruna, my book, will, will bring to light that this must be acknowledged, and that if you're going to give therapy to these people, if you're going to intervene, if you're going to uh, give them support, uh, then we have to change uh, the, the strategies and also the honesty with which we approach that. And as I said, I don't think I would have been a very good fit for last year if most of the women were feminists, because uh, I, do blame, I do blame feminism uh, for uh, the fact that we no longer uh, are able to distinguish between our own honor, our own sense of honor, uh, and what we are an honor-free society, which is why we uh, find it very difficult to uh, acknowledge and understand what the concept of honor is to people whose entire cultures are dominated by it. Uh, we had this phenomenon of a slut walk uh, the other a couple of weeks ago. Slut walks were all over the place. Bring back, take back the name slut. Why? There's no honor in being a slut. But in our society, where uh, honor is kind of a bad word, except in the military, it's one of the last institutions where you do find the concept of honor, uh, where we, we feel that uh, you can be anything and do anything, uh, or, uh, that women can, they can act in any way at all, uh, and they should not consider that they are shaming anybody, least of all themselves. You know, uh, it's kind of the dichotomy between the two cultural observations is between the burqa and nudity. It's a spectrum of what you consider decent. Uh, too much on this side, you've got your uh, uh, cultures that, that make too much out of honor, and you've got cultures like ours that are hell-bent on making nothing out of honor. I think there's a middle road. I'm running out of time, so uh, I think this is the point I want to make, that if you want to understand uh, cultures that are all about honor, you have to realize that a little bit of honor is necessary for a healthy society. Uh, and I'll leave it there, and I hope uh, that you will, in next February, uh, look out for our book, uh, read it, and I think you'll find that uh, Aruna's story is both grip gripping, informative, uh, and redemptive in its own way, to show what a person can do who has come from nothing and, and suffering and abuse, uh, what they can make of their lives when they're in a free country. Thank you. We had a good range last year. Some were feminists, some were anti-feminists, okay. and so on. Let's have a picture. For, for those of you who are curious, uh, there is another opinion smith in this community. His name's Jonathan Kay, and yes, they are related. The Kay is an opinion machine. Thank you very much. Thanks.